Howdy folks, Shell Presto de Baggio here, awesome artist, remarkable writer, and undaunted luminary of my time. I'm here today with magnificent Mike de Baggio. Hello, Internet. My uh, co-writer for the Ascension Epoch. So I recently did a video on uh, using yourself as a basis to create multiple characters. But there's a, another method you can go about, of course. There's multiple methods of character creation. And today I want to talk about putting uh, or taking established ideas and putting your own spin on them so that you can create something new and original without going completely from scratch. And by pre-existing characters, uh, of course, we have a lot of those that we've taken from uh, public domain sources, both uh, comic books from the 30s and 40s, and uh, the, the uh, great adventure novels and scientific romances of the 19th century and early 20th century that are uh, appear in our books as characters or as uh, um, uh, important people in, in our in our in our alternate history. But we're also talking about uh, taking a character and and or rather inspiration from this character and and creating something new new from it. Um, and before we get into that, just a, a word of what we're, we're not talking about um, is is fan fiction, where you do a you you, you take a pre-existing character and you write them in a way that's completely alien to how that character has always a, um, acted and, and behaved before, and and that's something that I, I call it fan fiction, but it actually is I think insulting to to you know, le legitimate fan fiction writers, but it's very popular now in, in modern comic books where you have uh, writers who have uh, some sort of axe to grind or they don't know a character or they dislike a character and so they basically come on to destroy them. I'm not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about um, creating your original characters uh, but uh, basing them off of ideas or, or other uh, ex characters from other stories. Uh, in you know, in our case, public domain stories, um, and for instance, uh, a, a different, a different but respect, a respectable take on, on that character. Um, you know, the have them be the the offspring, um, or or the descendant, or the partner of of one of these these characters, or uh, a wholly new character that yet takes inspiration from, in in some way, from some of the these these books or, or movies or what have you. And the, the obvious example uh, that we can bring up with that is the Promethean from uh, Copper Knights and Granite Men, in our Challenger Confidential series. The, the Promethean, uh, as his name suggests, uh, was actually the inspiration in our universe for Mary Shelley to, uh, to have written Frankenstein. Um, the, the subtitle, or the alternate title to uh, Frankenstein, of course, being the, the, the modern Prometheus. And the idea was that in our universe, Mary Shelley wrote the book just like she did here, and she got the uh, the idea from, from from John Polidori, who related a story to her about meeting um, a guy who happened to be the Promethean, and his experiments of bringing, uh, you know, reanimating dead flesh. And this intrigued her, and she wrote this very famous popular novel. Um, and the the Promethean was he was the source of this. And yet, it, it's uh, the character of Victor Frankenstein in the novel is is quite quite different um, from him, and, and some of the and and though the the events of the novel are based on this this uh, sort of exaggerated sketch that she was given, uh, they're they're not, um, of real things that happened. It's there. You know, he, he goes he goes to great extent to um, argue with people that you know. The book, the book is not a the book is not a biography, and it, it it relates certain things in a in a less than accurate way. Sorry about the noise there, folks. Uh, that was our dog underneath the table. Hopefully, he didn't make a lot of noise. But anyway, yes. So the, the Promethean is in, in some in a, some sense Victor Frankenstein, but we've taken the twist that you know he um, was the inspiration for that character rather than the the the, the literal the literal character. Oh, it's also very important to say that in universe, Mary Shelley never met 
the Promethean in person. Right. So she she's totally making everything up. Right. And he ha he has some sharp comments about her in the appendix to Copper Nights and Grand Man. Now, Victor Frankenstein happens to be a very appropriate basis for the Promethean because the Promethean is, um, he's, he's a hero, he's a heroic character, he's a wise character, but he's essentially a mad scientist. He has, uh, he's about 800 some years old, he's an alchemist that has figured out basically how to make himself biologically immortal. He has definitely um, dabbled in areas that uh, are beyond the realm of, um, you know, what is considered uh, appropriate and, and, and moral in his experiments over time. Um, but he's also he's also a brilliant and ambitious man. Uh, that though he's learned better now in his in his approaching his his ninth century of, ex of existence has done some very questionable things uh, in the past. Uh, I think one of the things is when you're writing a character like that too, uh, you know how do you figure out how he's going to speak? What his mannerisms are like when you're creating a new character. The Let's just say I, I know for a fact the public domain basis is not, uh, the public domain alone, the story alone, is not how you came up for the basis of his mannerisms. No, of course not. Um, I always had the idea, uh, the visual idea, when I thought of the Promethean, that he looked like Peter Cushing, um, who I, I mainly knew at the time from, as, as Grand Moff Tarkin from Star Wars, um, but then came to know, um, and again, here's the Frankenstein connection, because he very famously pay, um, played uh, Victor Frankenstein or some other Frankenstein relative in in many of the the Hammer Studios uh, horror <laughs> movies uh, from the 1950s through the the 1970s. The, the ridiculously excellent Hammer horror films. Yeah, the, and the, the movies, and and so um, while while the, the the visual idea of Peter Cushing, and of course, if you look at Shell's drawings of the Promethean, he. Um, you know, there is obviously a resemblance to Peter Cushing, um, and that's intentional. But he, his, uh, the, the, his manner of speech, his mannerisms, the way he talks, uh, from particularly in the, in the Hammer movies, and I would say not just in the Frankenstein ones either, but when he played uh, Van Helsing in, in the Dracula movies and so forth, uh, that and 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 other other uh, Hammer horror movies certainly have. Uh, influence the way we have him talk and act. He has a he has a, a he has a sort of arrogant air about him, but also very a very confident, um, very very in control, very very um, imp imperious manner about him as well. Uh, but he's also a, a very outwardly polite, ur urbane. Yeah, he's a gentleman. Man. He's a gentleman. So that's one example of using an, an existing character or, or a portrayal of a character and yet turning it into into your own um but let's take another character from the same book from copper and Granite man we'll talk about uh bulwark who is a in our he's, he's a construction worker who interferes in the robbery of the museum and he he's gassed with the, this fossilization formula that uh has turned everybody else completely to stone him only partially to stone now if you know that the Challenger Foundation, uh, a lot of the 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 makeup of the team and, and their adventures, they're inspired by the the original. They have a, a feel very much like the original Stanley Jack Kirby Fantastic Four. They're more of a family than they're a superhero team, but they're more of a family than anything. And uh, especially in the original Fantastic Four comics, they were always at each other's throats. They're always fighting with each other. Um, and they had, had lots of very strong personality clashes that really made that comic stand out, made it super popular, and really still stand today as some of the finest uh, comics ever, ever made, ever. Um, so, if you know anything about the Fantastic Four... I, I, let's boil it down to this. Mike, who's your favorite member of the Fantastic Four? The Thing. Who's your favorite member of the Fantastic Four? Why, The Thing. Of course, I... Uh, um, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing. I think the thing is probably most people's favorite member of the Fantastic Four. And Bulwark, as a guy who's partially turned to stone, you can guess is, is sort of like the thing. Um, but we have... Uh, of course, he's not exactly... doesn't really look anything like him. Uh, and, and... 
and he his background doesn't match his his background's very different and even his his uh he's he's similar in the sort that in the sense that he is a, a blue collar work a day fellow who uh, is a very much a normal guy who he's very plain spoken he's very he's, he's forthright but he's also he's, he's a nice guy um where he's different from the thing though is that he we, we took away all of the, the self-loathing yes yeah he, he bulwark is is thrilled to be uh made of stone okay well, he, he's gone from a work a day johnny to having like a you know, making four times as much money, yeah. doing way less work. And now, now he's you know he he thinks it's great. He's a, sort of a man of action, um, and he was a little a mar on the marginal side of superhumanly strong before. He's even better now, and he he really likes uh, doing something other than than like menial manual labor, which was more or less all he was, uh, yeah. you know, shaken up up for. But. Also, Jack Kirby's thing was short. Bulwark seven feet tall, so right. it didn't matter that he had marginal super strength to begin with. But what I really want to talk about now is not so much uh, what you'd probably say. Is like, well, obviously he's he's uh, inspired by the thing. And I apologize again for all the noise. We have some very uh, noisy animals bothering us today. If you guys want more videos from us, you have to deal with do dog and baby noises. But the uh, anyway, the inspiration I want to talk about is actually from the eighteen ninety five weird fiction novel that the Copper Nights Grant Man is based off of, and that's The King in Yellow. And The King in Yellow um, is a, a very influential uh, weird fiction horror. Um, it's actually a collection of short stories. It influenced everybody from Lovecraft to Stephen King. And in particular, Copper Nights Grant Man is a con continuation of two stories from The King of the, the, uh, the Repair of Reputations and The Mask. Right, and in the mask uh, is the story of a sculptor and alchemist, Boris Yvain, who uh, basically creates this fossil uh, fossilization uh, solution, um, and it can turn actual living thing. It's 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 the um, sculptor's equivalent of it is to sculpting what photography is to painting. Right, it can actually take uh, a, a snapshot of, of something in life. Um, and I won't get too much into the, the, the story itself, but the, the fossilization solution that was used on Bulwark um, is, is uh, a derivation of, of, of Boris Savini's fossilization solution from The King in Yellow. And, and yet, it seems quite obvious, like, well, we wanted to have a character who was big and tough and, and had a rocky hide, yeah. uh, and, and the story was, was based on this, but yet I did not initially come up with the, the idea of that being his origin. It, it's funny. Bulwark wasn't in the book at all originally. Um, we didn't have a guy partially turned to stone. And then actually it was because we were debating how the final fight should go. And uh, we wanted another player in it. And I was like, why Why don't you use... He had the uh, idea for a character. The name Bulwark and it was a big rocky guy. He had no idea what the personality was going to be like. He right. had no idea uh, what his origin was. And I was like, we have a villain turning people to stone. Why not just have it work halfway on him? And, uh, and that's Bulwark's origin right there. Yeah, so, so in this case, we, we took a source from something that is very, very far away from uh, superhero comics. Yeah, we use it to make a superhero. Um, the, we took a, 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 an element... And that, and to be to be honest with you, in terms of, of the of this the King and Yellow narrative itself, it's sort of a side point, right? That this this fossilization solution, it's just a it's just a weird element of it, and we took it major made it a major point and gave it made, baked it into this character's origin, um, and actually it, it important for another member of the Challenger Foundation, um, actually one of the main villains of the, that novel who comes over to their side, um, Kamistra, uh, who. Uh, her, her quest to duplicate Boris Yvain's solution, uh, the fossilization solution, I mean, is uh, is a real important element to, to that to that story. Uh, I think it's also worth noting too that, like you, you can obviously tell that there's uh, say similarity, like you know thing thing when there's a fight turns into the happy-go-lucky member of the Fantastic Four. 
and you know bulwark relishes a fight too um so you're like oh well with these similarities i think people are afraid to make characters similar to another character like i i've had uh friends writing books and it's like oh i changed this because this seemed too much like like something else and the the real thing is that once you create a character and you start having other things happen to them, like, you know, you have a character and they go through events. You know, Bork was a workaday Johnny, but he obviously is married and he has a kid and, you know, he gets turned into a superhero. Which is another sense in which he's vastly different from the thing, who can't doesn't have any success in romance. He yeah, probably, probably can't have kids. or and a big question mark there, whereas, you know, Bork goes into this as a father, um, you know, a as you have these things that are going to happen to your characters, happen to your characters, they become their own original people, they start going on their own journey, um, once you have them start interacting with other characters, like, you know, by the end of uh, the tentative title is A Boy and His Dog, you know, uh, Bulwark's uh, relationship with his other team members changes, you know, he comes out of that like a different person and, you know, looking at people in a different way, too. So, it's they're going to become your characters. You just have to get started and write, too. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of um, writing writers move between the two extremes, one of which is, is being stuck on fan fiction. They don't want to create anything new or they feel that they can't. Um, and they just they just want to tell tell new stories with the same characters in the, in the same fundamentally the same setting, and then at the other extreme are those who's like, who have this almost psychotic need to differentiate themselves from anything that's ever come before, and and will literally trash their own uh, in, trash their own manuscripts if after having completed it they find out that some obscure book that has a vaguely similar plot uh, happened before we we run into some of these characters at at, at, at conventions actually yeah, uh, so that tell us these stories so somewhere there was a really really great somewhere some at some point someone had a really really great story about a, a boy orphan going into a wizard school yeah and it was entirely <laughs> different than harry potter but right. because harry potter came out like you know they they burned it and and honestly there there's there's so many uh var variations on the theme um you know, if we're going to talk about uh, classic public domain stories, and uh, <laughs> let's talk, let's talk about Joseph Conrad's Heart, Heart of Darkness, right? Well, that's not what I was going to say, but go ahead. Well, and and if you know Heart of Darkness, you probably you, you may actually know more about it because it was basically adapted into a movie called Apocalypse Now. That was wasn't which was set in the Vietnam War. Uh, but of course, Heart of Darkness was not it was set in Africa in, in the in the eighteen hundreds, and but it's it's the same basic story. Yet these are no one said, "Oh, geez, apocalypse now!" That's a hack. That's that's a piece of crap. It's it's a, it's you know a very, very famous, very highly highly regarded movie. Uh, I was going to say uh, a princess of Mars, and uh, is it Lieutenant Gulliver Jones? Yeah, yeah, sure. So His vacation. Two two examples right there of of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, A Princess of Mars, the first of the John Carter books, is extremely similar in 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 many ways to. Uh, a, a book that came out a few years before that, which was Lieutenant Gulliver Jones' his Vacation. Um, and there's, there's a lot of similarities and a lot of people have remarked on them. They both weirdly They're get whisked away to Mars. Mars and, and, and the weird, and like there's, the, you know, the journey down the river and the, you know, the, the circumstance of the princess and, the, you know, this this military man um, coming and fight, you know. And there, there's, there's actually, Gulliver Jones and John Carter are significantly different as characters. Uh, but certainly, there, there's a lot of um, obvious similarities between the two, and we, we use both of them in our Ascension Epoch universe. I, I as well. would just like to state for posterity that I prefer Gulliver Jones. <laughs> and that Mike has a awesome story coming out that'll be available on HeroicAdventureFiction.com. You'll have to stay tuned to that. It's uh, Gulliver Jones's adventure in Pellucidar. Uh But anyway, without going down that rabbit hole, there we have, um, you know, as Shell's mentioned before, our our the idea for creating the Century Epoch has started with uh, this superhero RPG we were running that, that had some original characters, but mostly was using existing comic book characters that, that we loved. And and when we when she finally convinced me to do it, I was like, well, gee, what do we have? Um, I mean, we just so what we basically did was we took the characters, existing characters, and we created new names for them, 
and um, we, 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 we built on from there. But in the very early stages, long before anything was published, a lot of characters weren't really any different from the characters we were playing. But this goes to what Shell was just talking about uh, a few minutes ago, that over time they become enormously different. For instance, um, um, our... Uh, you can go ahead. I do just want to say, I think the technical term for that is pastiche. It's a pastiche, yeah. Yeah, right. lots of people do it. It's not a new concept. Uh, and, and very, very, uh, uh, you know, f famous and important authors have done it. Um, Michael Moorcock did it for, um, he sort of, the pastiche of Edgar Rice Burroughs, The Princess of Mars, uh, the John Carter books. Um, and in fact, his father said that they were the very best books he's ever written. Um, no. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, what? P people like Watchmen. Well, Watchmen is just a pastiche, pastiche of, of the Charleston, Charlton characters. characters. Right, exactly. So there, you can create um, really cool stuff in, in that manner, and, and it's not it's not a knock against it. But to give an example of the Sentinel. Sentinel is was originally our stand-in for Captain America, and there are certain similarities to him. Of course, in our universe, World War II didn't happen. Um, so that's one of the most obvious things, but we, we have... Oh, the we, we didn't say that. There was a Martian invasion. That's why World War II didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, so there... Uh, right. Um, but the the Sentinel is has over time become so significantly different from Captain America, even though he basically fits the mold of, of the uh, super soldier created for war, right? And he's, uh, and, and he's also like a man out of time. In, in our case, he wasn't frozen. He just hasn't really aged any since then um and he has you know uh, yet like our the the sentinel is, has now become such a complex multifaceted character there's so many details about his origin that there, that um if and when hopefully soon captain america enters the public domain if we decide to integrate him again um into, into the ascension epoch um he he would be significantly different enough from the Sentinel that we, we could do that. Another example, um, one of the main characters from our East End regular books, Corona, was based on Firestar. Uh, if you probably know Firestar from Spider-Man, His Amazing Friends, the cartoon. Uh, but she was an important character in, in our RPG. But um, she, she um, you she's, know... She, she's not like Firestar at all anymore. Right. And, and I don't even mean in the sense that the um, writers at Marvel have, have ruined most of the characters now. I mean, like, she, she just has grown and developed in ways that we couldn't possibly um, imagine when we first said, okay, this is our Erzatz Firestar, right? This is our Erzatz Captain America. Right. Uh, this is our well, er Erzatz uh, Iron Man or something like that. Uh, I think a, a big thing is, you know, just the, the interactions between... Uh, Firestar and her, not Firestar, <laughs> Corona and her father, because her, her father was part of the Compass Society, and, you know, he, he has an entirely different view of superheroes and everything like that, so they're, you know, ju just that dynamic has changed who she is, because she's very much looking for other talents like herself and people she has in common with, Right. so she has this, uh, entirely different reason for wanting to socialize the way she does and wanting to become a superhero. Right. Um, yeah, there, there are certain key points about her, her origin and, um, you know, taking her out from the comic Firestar um, of how she was involved with the White Queen and, and the Hellions and the Hellfire Club and everything like that. Removing Corona from that context automatically creates this very different tra trajectory, right? Um, and so there, there's examples right there of, of how you can even make somewhat small and maybe even seemingly insignificant changes that over time um, make the, the character wholly different, even in your own mind, even though you know where, where, they, where they came from. And I was going to say uh, threads, too. Like, that's just a spin on the Spider-Man premise. Sure. It's like you... But get an entirely different set of bug powers, and you don't <laughs> have the the super, you know. St Stanley liked giving everyone like super strength and letting them yeah. be able to flip cars and stuff like that, and you know a, a lot of Marvel heroes and stuff like that have been vastly overpowered. Right. And so he he's got the, I stick to walls and I can make thread, but he doesn't have any of the super strength that could make you know lifting 
people are swinging bad or right. swinging around baddies useful. He has the proportionate strength of a caterpillar, <laughs> which is 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 not very impressive. So, I mean, really, the point of doing this video is saying is to tell people that if you feel daunted by creating characters, you know, you you don't have to go wholly from scratch. You can take inspiration from you know, the public domain and things you like, uh, you know, you just have to change it enough. And the truth is, everybody does that. Everybody bases characters um, on things they've seen before, on people they know in real life, uh, and, and they add their own little twists and, and variations on it. And over time, if, if, as you're writing a story, um, very rarely do you sit down and know everything that you're going to write in a story. I, in fact, that has never, ever happened to me. I don't think it ever will. Uh, so as you're writing it, the character will change and grow in your mind, even as uh, as, as you're, you're typing the words. It, it, and even if you just use it as a way to change up the dialogue and not have everyone sound like you, you know, if you have an actor in the back of your mind to, you know, help you figure out how to word things differently for a specific character or... The you... sort of expressions they use, the accents they, they have, um, the, the, if they have a more indirect, a more formal manner of speaking or a more blunt um, manner of speaking. Those are all things that you can uh, get that probably don't instantly spring to mind but come from some impressions you have from, from other characters or other people. All right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's... Hopefully that helps you guys create some characters. Hopefully that gets you scared of, or not scared, ho hopes allay your fears about writing and creating your own characters. And before we sign off, let me just say that if any of those characters or stories sound interesting to you, please uh, check out our books on heroicadventurefiction.com. You can read uh, many of our, our um, the at least opening chapters to several of our books there. Um, and if you like them, you can support us by becoming a, a, a patron, or you can go on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or any fine retailer and buy our books. We have uh, six novels and short story collections uh, available in ebook and paperback form. All right. Hope you guys have an awesome day. Presto, over and out. Mike, signing off. Once again, you knew to stick around. You are a wise person indeed. But we knew about that because of your taste in YouTube videos. Um, a little while back, I showed I got a new copy of How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. And I said that my old copy was beat up. And a couple people actually requested they wanted to see just how beat up my How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way was. So. Here you go. This is how beat up my How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way is. Um, now first off, this, this is a great drawing book. This is not the first drawing book that I have ever gotten. Um, I had one cartooning book and I think a book on how to draw dogs before this. Um, but this is the first one that I bought myself with my own money. And I actually bought it at a pawn shop. Um, and it was not in good condition when I got it. As a matter of fact, you'll see it's in multiple pieces now. But when I first bought it, it was already in two pieces. Uh, it, it was separated right on this page, which uh, tells you how to draw the female face, and that's totally Sue Storm, so, you know. Uh, invisible girl right there. Uh, Back in the day, when it first came out in 1978, uh, it was only 10 bucks. I bought it probably in like 1993 or 1994. I was 10 or 11, and I got it used in two pieces in a pawn shop for I think seven bucks. So yeah, the, this thing has been through the ringer. Uh, I've had it a, a long, long time now. It's over 20 years old, and it was old when I got it, too, because I think that this is the uh, original printing from the early 70s. 
and uh, yeah I, I really can't recommend this book enough um, you know it goes through the basics of drawing and everything like that um, and I will say one thing uh, that you know one of the things that really held me back we'll say when I was drawing and one of the humps that I had to get over as it were is uh, I remember when I first started trying to draw comics uh, I would draw like this uh, with the cylinders and when I when I specifically put blocks like that my drawings got very very stiff they never looked fluid like this um, and it wasn't until I actually learned to use this scribble method. Uh, I still use the, the shapes to some extent, like I always draw the rib cage in, but uh, I almost always scribble now. And that really, really loosened up my drawings. Uh, and getting from this method to having a good idea of how foreshortening works and uh, and the natural shapes in the arms as opposed to imposing uh, the unnatural shape of say cylinders is a big jump and you really have to know what you're doing to get there but you can get there and when you do uh, your art will start to look much much more fluid and the poses will look much more natural and dynamic um, and dynamic is especially the is, is especially the, the hard part to go off of there because uh, as you'll see when you when you do uh, cylinders the form tends to be very rigid um, because it is it's it's a block you're you're you know drawing something solid um, but when you start using the scribble method you can see it's especially noticeable in Thor's leg here that uh, it's you have a, a subtle curve to the bones uh, and the the muscles on top of the bones lay in such a way that you you get very uneven shapes that uh, can be hard to differentiate when you put this in so yeah I, I just thought I'd share and uh, you know there's there's still stuff in this book that 20 years later I, I can flip through and I'm trying to learn today. Um, I did not color in crayon in this book. Uh, the, those kind of wonderful things are what came with the book. So, um, But yeah, all, all of that. Uh, you know, I, I still go back to the sections on composition and inking and it's it's still a very good Still a very good book, written from when my, you can see the black lines and stuff on here. This thing has seen such better days. Um, you're not black, but the the dust lines on here. And, oh, if you hear that ruckus, that's my son playing drums. Um, but yeah, and th this was, you know, a book back in the day from when Marvel uh, had a house style and uh, were trying and encouraging people to draw a particular way. And I, I just think it's a great book for learning to draw uh, classically, as it were, or as far as classic comics go. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this little thing. Uh, presto, over and out. Farewell and adieu to you, ladies of Spain.